Uh, for those of you who may have only just got your breakfast, for those of you who may have only just got your breakfast, please continue to enjoy it, um, and that includes me actually. So, uh, we now move to the more formal or part of today's event. I'd like to introduce Mike Horn, who is the Chief Executive of Deloitte New Zealand. Deloitte is an active and enthusiastic and in fact long-term supporter of the Chamber and Wellington's business community. This is the 10th year they've been the key sponsor of the pre-budget event. Mike, thank you very much and, and your team. We're delighted as always to partner with you on today's event and I'll ask Mike to introduce the Minister formally now. Thanks Mike. Thank you, Simon, and thanks to the Chamber for the opportunity. You know, we're big supporters of the work that the, cha the Chamber does. Uh, so, inga iwi, inga mana, inga rau rangatera. Tina koutou katoa. Kou mai kōn, toko ingoa. Kou a hou, te kai whakahaere o Deloitte. No reira, tina koutou, tina koutou, tina koutou katoa. So, look, it's wonderful to see you all here again this morning, and on behalf of Deloitte, it's, it's our honour to again sponsor this event with the Wellington Chamber of Commerce. I'd also like to acknowledge the, present, uh, the presence of the Honourable uh, Minister Grant Robertson, uh, who I know we're all looking forward to hearing from soon. It's clear that we're facing economic headwinds, and it's important that appropriate responses are implemented and economic pressures, you know, which we see almost daily with the rising costs of living you know, that are impacting most New Zealand households. So it's therefore been really great you know, to see indications from both the Prime Minister and Minister Robertson that we can expect to see some real focus on addressing this in the budget. What that will see is, is you know, I think it will help to ease the burden that many are experiencing with everyday stress. Economic pressures have obviously not been helped by the impact of the Auckland floods and Cyclone Gabriel. Significant investment is required in the affected regions to help not only with the immediate response, but also over the longer term to help these communities return to normal with necessary future-proofing for infrastructure. The balancing of long-term initiatives and the need to address the most uh, pressing core current issues you know, will be key to New Zealand's ongoing success. As we've already seen in, in the recent moves by the government, some programmes of work will now need to be reprioritised to strengthen others. Infrastructure, climate response and the key sectors of health, housing and education are all inherently linked. And there's no doubt that the way that these are addressed individually will have flow-on effects for the others. Investment in skills, training and education has been and continues to be a challenge for business. And we know that a skilled workforce is central to the growth of New Zealand's key sectors and industries to continue to ensure that New Zealand can hold its own on the world stage. But it's all about getting the balance right. Settings to facilitate improved productivity and considered investment for the future are critical while balancing the available fiscal envelope through this year's budget. The decisions being made today and over the next decade are decisions which will shape our future. And it's a fine balance, you know, balancing our prosperity now, but also for the years to come. So I'm sure none of us uh, envy the role that Minister Robertson has in ensuring that right balance of priorities. But for me, it's also a call to action for all of those in this room because the partnership between the private and public sector is absolutely fundamental. And the public sector can do some of the heavy lifting in terms of you know, providing the right signals, but ultimately it's about how the private sector also embraces and executes within that framework that's equally fundamental. Deloitte has started releasing our expert budget commentary uh, in the lead up to next week's announcement, and we'll be doing more so on the actual day. So I think you'll see on the tables there, if you scan the QR code, it'll take you directly to our, um, our budget hub uh, and you'll see more of our pre-budget uh, analysis. So now it's my real honour and pleasure uh, to introduce uh, Minister Robertson up to the stage. O tihe mauri ora, uh, hi na mana whenua uh, ki tēnei rohi, uh, Taranaki Fanui to Upoko o Taika, uh, tēnā koutou katoa, tēnā koe uh, kara, uh, ena mana e nā reo uh, raurangatira mā ana hoa e whā, uh, tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā koutou, uh, tēnā koutou katoa. Uh, greetings everybody, um, Kava thank you uh, for your, your mihi and also Simon um, and Mike for uh, your kind words. I also want to acknowledge uh, 
uh, Deloitte and the other sponsors for helping uh, bring this to us, and especially acknowledge uh, the Chamber, Tiawe, and the Wellington uh, Pacifica Business Network. Uh, Paul, you're a very, very busy man. Uh, I'm sure you'll be popping out to cook breakfast down, uh, down the road very shortly, but thank you uh, very much for, for all that you're doing as well. Can I acknowledge my ministerial colleague, uh, the Honourable Barbara Edmonds, um, who's with us here today. I'm sure there are a number of other members of parliament. It's always dangerous to start listing them off. You don't want to offend people. You never know when you're going to need them. Uh, so um, I just want to, uh, I can see, actually I can see a few there. There's Tamati Coffee. I saw Paul Eagle when I was coming in. Anyone else, um, please, my acknowledgements to you. Also acknowledge members of the diplomatic corps who are with us here today, including the Australian High Commissioner, uh, Harinder Singh. This is my sixth time for speaking at the Wellington uh, Chamber of Commerce's pre-budget speech. The sixth time around, there is certainly some familiarity in the budget process. There's the usual dance of me trying not to be filmed eating while not appearing to be rude to my hosts. I've actually got my KPI on that today. <laughs> I'm also very well used to my colleagues' long-standing commitment to putting in far more budget bids than there is money to fulfil them. And then there is the now traditional pandemic, natural disaster or global economic shock that accompanies our budgets. In fairness to the global economy, it's continued to come up with novel and creative shocks for us to deal with each year. Most notably, we faced the effects of COVID-19 and the necessary economic and public health response that followed from that. And as all of you are very well aware, this was followed by supply chain disruptions, including global labour supply issues and the energy crisis sparked by the illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia, both of which have fueled elevated rates of inflation. In April, the IMF again downgraded its forecast for global growth in 2023. To, to the point that growth in advanced economies is now expected to only be 1.3%. Over the next five years, the global economy is set to grow at the slowest pace since the 1990s. And obviously, more recently, we have seen here in New Zealand a number of extreme weather events that have brought the increasing impact of climate change to the forefront of our minds. We continue to acknowledge the significant impact that the cyclone and flooding has had on a number of communities, many of whom have been hit with further deluges this week. I'll have more to say about our support for these communities in the coming days. During the last few years, our economy and our society have undergone a series of whiplash shifts that have tested the resilience of our households, our communities, our business sector, and our government. It's actually hard to imagine a period in post-World War II history when the well-being of our nation has been put under greater strain from an economic, environmental or social perspective. Now these are of course global trends and it all sounds very depressing, but in the face of these challenges, I believe that there is positive news for New Zealand. We have managed these challenges better than many countries who have been in similar positions. The success of our health response to COVID-19 is well known and has been recognised by many international organisations and observers. We can be extremely proud as a country that we have had the lowest excess mortality rate in the world across the period of the pandemic. And at the same time, since the emergence of COVID-19, economic activity in real terms is more than 6% above its pre-pandemic level. In the face of an historic economic shock, unemployment peaked at 5.2%, and as of the first quarter of 2023, sits at a near record low of 3.4%. Unemployment's actually been below 4% for seven consecutive quarters. And we are also beginning to see the shift in immigration numbers that many of you have been looking for. Numbers to the end of February show that we have net migration of 52,000. In the following month of March 2023, we saw more visas processed for people to work here than we did in the equivalent month in March 2019 before COVID hit. Now, none of these statistics are meant to downplay the current economic environment. It is seeing many New Zealanders struggling with the cost of living and businesses feeling the pressure of increasing prices and slowing activity. I know that it is tough out there for many people. What I also know is that it's better to be facing this situation with the numbers that I've just mentioned, and with public debt significantly lower than many other countries, and with inflation that is in the bottom third of the OECD. 
Our solid starting point comes from the hard work of businesses and workers with the support of government through the last few years. And this does mean that the challenges of 2023 can be met and that we will emerge strong and resilient through these difficult times. In response to all of this, the government has continued the balanced approach that took us safely through COVID. We've targeted support to those low and middle income households that are most exposed to cost of living pressures, including superannuitants, families and those on low incomes. Despite the welcome news that inflation does appear to have peaked, there is no doubt that it remains too high and we are committed to playing our part in bringing that down, including by reducing our spending as a percentage of the economy over the coming years. I stand by our approach to COVID. It saved lives and it saved livelihoods. Now's the time to move back to a more sustainable fiscal position. So that's the context in which Budget 2023 has been developed. The Budget will have four overarching themes. They are supporting New Zealanders with the cost of living, delivering the services that New Zealanders rely on, recovery and resilience, including economic resilience, and fiscal sustainability. And it's the last of those, fiscal sustainability, that I'm focusing on today. Exactly what you want with your breakfast, I'm sure. However well we've responded to some of the shocks the economy has faced in recent years, these events have come at a cost. Lives have been disrupted by COVID-19, and those effects can endure in a way that's obscured by the success of the overall response. I just want to take a moment to make a particular acknowledgement of the mental health impact of the last few years. I recently spent time with a small business owner who, having successfully navigated COVID, found themselves dramatically affected by Cyclone Gabriel. They were stoic, but they were battered. The government has moved to provide further financial support to this person and others like them, but that mental toll is considerable. I urge anyone in those circumstances to reach out, including to the 1737 helpline, and for all of us to be aware of supporting those around us. In the case of businesses, I can also recommend the First Steps program developed by the government with the Auckland Chamber and EMA, which is specifically targeted to helping small and medium enterprises to cope with the strains that they are facing. Increases to the cost of living are also adding pressure, and these are not felt equally across society. Indeed, one of the pernicious things about higher inflation is that those with the economic power to do so are often able to pass on increased costs, while those with little economic power are the ones who ultimately bear the burden of inflation. The period of elevated inflation that we've seen in recent times has also put public services under considerable pressure. Now, you may have heard some people suggest that periods of high inflation are positive for the government, and that's true to some extent in terms of the flows of revenue. However, what that view doesn't take into account is the pressure that inflation is putting on the funding of public services that New Zealanders rely on. As I mentioned earlier, I don't need to tell you that the labour market's been tight, and finding staff coupled with accelerated wage growth has put pressures on businesses. Given that the government is the largest employer in the economy, I also understand that. And we've been working to backfill the infrastructure deficit that's been built up over, after decades of underinvestment, and that includes work to improve the supply of housing in New Zealand in order to make home ownership more affordable and to accelerate the building of our housing stock. These sorts of projects are central to the vision that the Labor government has for New Zealand. But they are not immune to the limits that the construction sector capacity has hit up against or to the supply chain disruptions that have pushed up material costs. We're buying the same jib that you are and we're having the same difficulties of accessing skilled labour at a time when unemployment rates are low across developed countries. So others may suggest to you that inflation means that the government can afford to do any number of things, including tax cuts. Now, this might be a convenient political line to run, but I don't believe it's an economic policy that's appropriate to this time in New Zealand. Adequately funding the services New Zealanders rely on every day is a serious challenge and one which has occupied much of our time and resources in the budget that I'll deliver next week. Picking up what Mike just said, making sure that we meet the needs of our people in health, in education, and in housing is core, and it simply has to come first. Now, this still requires hard trade-offs and difficult decisions. I appreciate that not all of you would have agreed with every decision that I have made as finance minister. If you did, I possibly shouldn't be in the job I'm in. 
But I do hope that people would credit me with always being upfront about the challenges we're facing and what difficult decisions mean for our future. I don't go around telling people that spending on public services can go up, public debt can go down, and taxes can be cut all at the same time. That fiscal Bermuda Triangle is the domain of the opposition, and I don't believe it's realistic or credible. If someone is asking you to trust them with running the government, and they can't clearly tell you how they will pay for it, or what we will be giving up in order to meet their promises, then they're not taking you seriously, or, in my view, the responsibility of governing. Our approach is to find balance in our fiscal strategy. We will continue to make use of our balance sheet, particularly to fund long-term infrastructure. Now, when we refer to using the government's balance sheet, what we actually mean is that we're making a judgment that supporting each other through the difficulties of a particular shock or meeting a long-term need is worth spreading some of those costs over a longer period of time. We have made good use of our balance sheet, and I do believe that was worth doing because we made it through challenges like COVID in a stronger position as a country than we otherwise would have. At times in the past, the debate around public debt in New Zealand has been one that's gone beyond what's a sensible level of caution for a small open economy to one that prioritised reaching a very specific debt target as if it was an end in itself and to the neglect of many other important considerations. We need to be clear-eyed about the fact that as a result of climate change, extreme weather events are occurring more frequently and with greater intensity, and as a country, we need to build our resilience. From the point of view of the government's finances, we do have space within the fiscal rules that we've set to manage the costs associated with responding to COVID-19 and the recent extreme weather events. Our debt sits at around 19% of GDP, well below the 30% ceiling that we indicated when we set the fiscal rules last year. It continues to compare well with the countries that we like to compare ourselves to, such as Australia at 36%, the United Kingdom at 95%, and the United States at 96%. Now, it is clear that the economic outlook has slowed, both here in New Zealand and internationally. And it's inevitable that this will have an impact on our key fiscal indicators. We can also expect to see tax revenue lower than we previously expected, as we saw in the Crown accounts to the end of March that were released this week. Our position remains strong and we are resilient, but there is no avoiding global and climatic forces. As the Prime Minister has demonstrated through the reprioritisation exercise, we have brought our focus back to a smaller number of things that the country needs to get right now and those things done well. Other priorities, which while they may be important, are ultimately discretionary and they've been stopped or deferred. We have seen a large amount of spending associated with COVID-19 coming out of the system and our spending is now tracking back towards the low 30% of GDP range that New Zealand has tended to operate in in recent decades. We're striving for balance here as well. Going faster in that track would require significant cuts to core services to austerity levels and would have long-term consequences for people and communities, and I am not prepared to do that. In order to make sure that we can ensure the well-being of our people through an increasingly uncertain future, there are a few things that we will be doing. First, as the Prime Minister mentioned in his pre-budget speech at the end of April, the further costs that the government will incur in relation to the cyclone recovery will be met within the budget operating allowance or multi-year capital allowance. This means that on the operating side in particular, we have put responding to the cyclone ahead of some of the other priorities that ministers would have liked to progress. I'm not suggesting that this is the way in which government should always choose to respond to major shocks. However, we are in an environment where the economy is still tight and it is therefore important that fiscal policy continues to work alongside monetary policy. Secondly, to ensure that we have an ongoing focus on efficiency and on prioritisation within the public sector. Now, this is not just something that we'll be asking ministers and agencies to do in the current tight conditions. It's something that we need to continue to drive and get better at if we're going to achieve the sort of things New Zealand should. I appreciate that this is the kind of thing that Ministers of Finance are supposed to say, and that regardless of political orientation, it's part of the job to see more efficiency, greater value for money, and greater prioritisation among other agencies. But we have to take action to prove that it's more than words. 
And so, finally, the budget sees the outcome of the request that the Prime Minister made of Cabinet to look closely at their baselines for opportunities for savings, efficiencies and reprioritisation. For the budget I will announce next week, agencies were told that we would be looking at a wide range of factors in determining their level of budget funding, including how many vacancies they were carrying, historic rates of underspends and the growth of FTEs over time. Ministers were sent a clear message that if they wanted to progress particular priorities, they needed to be looking for savings opportunities within their own agency's existing budgets. The outcome of this exercise is that Budget 2023 will include $4 billion of savings and reprioritisations over the four-year forecast period. For the most part, this funding has gone toward funding agencies' existing cost pressures. We'll detail in full what makes up this number when the budget's released next week. But to be clear, these savings have been found across a wide range of areas, some of which have been well publicised already. This includes closing contingencies that we weren't convinced were still needed, reassessing the forecast requirement of government departments, and returning as savings underspends from existing initiatives. The reprioritisation exercise has seen programmes such as the public media mergers stopped, the clean car upgrade and social leasing schemes curtailed, and further funding associated with the affordable water reforms and COVID programmes that are no longer needed returned. This kind of work's ongoing, but we've redoubled our efforts on it in this budget process. And I think we owe that to New Zealanders as they are carefully considering their spending and making trade-offs in their lives that we do the same. So, as I said at the beginning of, of the speech, there is a certain familiarity for me now in putting a budget together. But equally, I approach each of our bu budgets with a sense of the privilege of being in the position to be able to put together a programme that will support New Zealanders to achieve their potential. The shift we made to wellbeing budgets four years ago was driven by my belief that for all the numbers and percentages and forecasts that underpin a budget, our focus has to be on what it does for our people and for our environment and for our communities. And it has to focus on what we're doing for future generations. And this budget continues that approach. Equally, we can't deliver our wellbeing approach without being careful and considered when it comes to the financial domain. And that's what you'll see in this budget. You will see a balanced approach that will also have an eye to a future of a high wage, low emission economy that delivers economic security in good times and bad. Or to put it simply, we must support people today while building a better tomorrow. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. I think we're doing, oh, there he is. Hey, right. You're not off that lightly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Minister. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Minister Robertson, um, for your address uh, and taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, address us this morning um, and to give us a bit of a preview of what's coming up in your budget. Um, and, uh, and I think you have shared with us um, uh, some useful um, pointers about where we're headed and it, and it seems as though the message I take from that is we're all in this waka together uh, and, and certainly acknowledge um, your um, understanding of, of some of the pressures that businesses are facing um, and the anecdote that you shared uh, from the cyclone affected um, business person that you met with um, is very telling. Uh, just um, so you know, I'm, I'm Raphael Hilbrun and I'm representing the uh, Wellington Pacifica Business Network and the Power of Three. Uh, it's now time to open the floor to questions of the Minister, um, but I might just uh, start first. Um, Businesses are, as you say, um, living with this um, cost, of crisis, uh, uh, cost of living crisis, um, just like households are. Uh, there's a lot, of, um, a lot of costs coming on, on to businesses, and you pointed out that some are passing them on because they have the power to do so. Um, but I think we've probably reached those limits now, and um, the costs are still um, impacting businesses. Any views on, on what the budget might do to, to alleviate some of that pressure? appreciating that you can't give too much away. Yeah, thanks, Raphael. Uh, I mean, you know, obviously if there was a silver bullet, um, firstly would have, would have found it and fired it very, very quickly. Um, it has to be a combination of a lot of things. I, the first thing I'd say is 
I think I believe, and it's, it's backed by most economists that I read, that inflation has peaked, and so we are on the, the downward side of the hill, but it's not going to be an instant or an immediate thing. And so as a government, there's um, both long-term things we can do and short-term things that we can do. In terms of some of those short-term things, you know, we've been working closely with the business community on making sure that we do open up supply chains. Um, and through COVID, we were very specifically doing that with things like the subsidised air freight scheme. We now have a supply chain uh, ministerial group that works alongside the private sector to identify opportunities when we can come together and, and find ways of very practically opening up those supply chain issues. The second uh, sort of systemic issue, which I mentioned in my speech, which um, has been raised, is raised with me every, in every single business audience at every time, which is the availability of labour. And clearly that's been a significant issue. I'm very proud of the work we've done to train New Zealanders over the course of the pandemic. You know, more than 220,000 New Zealanders going through um, subsidised trade training or apprenticeships. But clearly the immigration system is needed to step up. And I know it's been a cause of frustration to many of the people who are in the room, but we're now getting there. And those stats that I gave you before that we're back at 52,000 net migration at the end of February, that we've got more work visas being processed, that's a critical way of being able to address these concerns about um, you know, wage pressure, for example, alongside that. And then, without making the answer too long, we've got some of the systemic things that we're looking at. You know, our ability to diversify our economy, diversify where we sell goods to, lift the value of what we do, all of those things help in those situations. At a practical level for households, um, I noted that there would be cost of living as one of the themes in the budget. Um, sadly, the Chamber doesn't get that scoop uh, today. Uh, but one of the things I'd like to say about that is in doing that and in finding ways to support people, we've got to make sure we don't... Um, put forward the risk of exacerbating the very thing we're worried about. You know, so we can actually end up exacerbating inflation by the kinds of things we do when we support people. And it's a constant balance and um, calibration of, of what the government does. So we've done a lot, um, 1st of April, big changes to support people on low incomes. But to me, that's a critical element of getting the balance right, finding the ways to support people with the cost of living that don't make the cost of living issues worse. And so that's the challenge we've worked through in putting the budget together. Thank you very much. Now we've got a couple of roving mics um, so that if anyone's game enough to ask the Minister a question, uh, you're more than welcome to. Ministers and MPs are excluded. <laughs> Hi Minister, um, my name's Breda and I'm also a representative of the Wellington Pacifica Business Network. Um, it's really good to hear that one of the pillars that you're focusing on in this budget is around the cyclone recovery. Um, and I know that just in terms of friends of mine that are business owners in the Hawke's Bay and in Auckland and Gisborne, um, you know, they've been severely impacted by the cyclone and the recent flood in Auckland yesterday of the state of emergency. Um, so the weather events are ongoing. And I know that over the years, the Labor Party have put in place um, initiatives to address climate change. And, but what I'm interested to hear about is what the focus is around um, adaptation and resilience and whether you're going to spend any money on changing infrastructure or all those sorts of things that I know that the business owners in those affected areas will want to know about. Thanks um, very much for the question, and funnily enough, that's actually the topic of my pre-budget speech I'm giving in Auckland tomorrow, so I don't know if you can make it, um, but, um, but listen in. Uh, to give you, you know, the short answer to your question around is yes, we have to be investing in the resilience of our infrastructure, and I would argue that as a country, we've failed to do that over successive decades, and there's no particular government I'm singling out with this. This is a, a long-term issue for New Zealand, and I mentioned in my speech the way in which we use our balance sheet to do that, in my view, that we haven't sufficiently done that in the past. It's interesting, um, uh, there was a, in Taradale, um, through the Provincial Growth Fund, we co-funded with the Hawke's Bay Regional Council, lifting a stock bank by a metre. Taradale didn't flood when the cyclone came through. So there are quite simple things we can do together in partnership with local communities to become more resilient. The other reflection I would have is that we are at a, a pivot point when it comes to adaptation. So the government will always strongly look to reduce our emissions. We've got to do that. 
we owe that to our children and our grandchildren to do our bit to make sure that, that we no longer pollute the planet the way that we have been up to this point. We also owe it to them and us to work on adaptation at the same time. And that mix is something that we're taking very, very seriously. As I say, there are practical things we can do, like stop banks. <laughs> there are longer term things we have to do about the resilience of our infrastructure, and that is very much a focus for us. But it is a partnership. Local government's got a big role to play. Iwi's got a big role to play. Uh, we've got to work together with businesses as well to make sure that that resilience is long term and it's embedded into all the decisions that we make. Uh, so, yes. Watch the space. Kia ora, Minister. Brad Hi, Olson, Brad. Uh, Wellington Chamber of Commerce Board member. Encouraging <laughs> here. <laughs> Anything else you want to divulge, Brad? While you're here? Nothing at all. Um, I, I don't, many people won't be aware. Um, look, you've talked a lot about prioritisation. I think that's important. Businesses are always having to have that difficult conversation this year as with any uh, other, but like you say, inflation is still high, interest rates are rising, those choices are difficult. Are you confident that Farno and businesses will see, will notice the impacts uh, of your budget uh, on their day-to-day -day lives after next week? Yeah, it's a good question, um, and I mean, obviously I'll say yes, um, because I think what we've put together is a good balanced package that addresses all of the issues we've been talking about today. We can't address all the issues, you never can, in one single budget. And getting that balance right between the investment we need to make to support people to deal with the cost of living, to be able to make sure we are doing the resilience initiatives that we need to do, to deliver the public services that we just rely on day to day, and do that in a way that, that doesn't burden future generations with unnecessary debt or make our financial position more challenging. Those four elements, which I mentioned as our priorities, it's a constant exercise of calibration, and so I feel like we've got it about right. Probably the biggest issue in putting this budget together has been the, obviously the cyclone arriving mid-preparation or in the second half of preparation of the budget, and inflation sticking higher for longer. So if you go back, which I know, Brad, of, of the people in the room, you will be the one who can say you've read every line of the budget policy statement from December, uh, that was put in a context where we were forecasting inflation to be lower than it is now, where we didn't forecast the cyclone. And so that has made it pretty challenging to, to get that balance right, but I, I feel confident about that. I'm interested in your comment about people noticing things in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, you know, a lot of things happen in people's day-to-day -day lives, and I'm acutely aware that when I'm doing budgets, um, I'm looking at this big picture with these giant numbers, and actually the reality of most people is they're getting up in the morning and they're trying to get the kids off to school and they've got a bill that they didn't think they were going to get. We've got to create both an environment in which those people feel supported and secure, but also one in which we deliver the, the basic things well. And that's very much, as you know, been Prime Minister Hipkins' message. And so I think probably that's a thing I think they would see and notice here, that we're, we're getting those basic things that matter in their life well, the quality of the schools that their kids go to, the health system that they occasionally have to interact with, the, um, the housing, the environment, the transport links. The other things that they don't sit there in the morning and go, I wonder what Grant Robertson's going to do about that. They just want them to work, and that's what we're focused on. Panic from Wellington City Council. Um, just following on from the first question, what are you going to do to support business to transition to a, a zero carbon economy? Yeah, thanks, Iona. And um, you would have already seen um, uh, an announcement about that um, from James Shaw uh, Tuesday of this week, where we've boosted our New Zealand Green Investment Finance Limited Fund by um, $300 million. This is a catalytic fund that we started in the last term of government. Uh, and it's now going to have a, had about $700 million of, of capital injections put into it. And it's designed to directly partner with the private sector to move towards lowering emissions. And so I'm really pleased that that fund's been able to do that. It's invested in things like solar panels, um, electrification of the bus fleet, those sorts of things. So there's a lot of work that we can do there. 
Uh, then we've got you know, further funding um, that we'll, we'll continue to deliver within what's called our GIDI fund, which is the government in incentivising decarbonising industry. So that is a specific fund, again, where we partner to do that. So uh, you know, the change we made last budget to create the Climate Emergency Response Fund will continue in this budget. So you can expect to see a set of initiatives, many of which business is able to, uh, to, to get a hold of. I've been really impressed, to be honest, over the last few years and the shifts I've seen both here in Wellington and around New Zealand from the business community in terms of taking uh, their responsibilities around climate seriously. It's undoubtedly the right thing to do, as I said before, for the planet and people like yourself, Anna, have devoted a lot of your lives to. It's also economic sense. And anyone who's involved in exporting will know, and I've said this message to the Chamber before, that the people we sell our goods to in the world, the services that we sell to the world, people want to know what we've been doing to produce that and how we're conscious we are of our environmental responsibilities. If you want to sell into the major supermarket chains in the UK, you need to know everything about your carbon footprint along the way. And so whether it's because you care deeply about the planet or whether it's because you're worried about whether you'll get access to those markets, those decisions are essential. And I think that's understood now and we'll certainly play our part to support business to do that. But as Mike said when he stood up before, there's a challenge for business itself to be able to say, well, what will we do? There was someone here. Yep. Talal Falava, Minister. Uh, Really appreciate uh, the position that you're in the country is and there's a lot of challenges that you face and I don't envy your job and your role. Uh, so my name's Tyron McCauley from Pickpock, also representing the New Zealand games industry. You talk a lot about resilience and that's a very important thing to focus on. Um, obviously the business sector is facing many challenges which you've outlined, uh, you know, so competition for wages, labour, uh, cost of business is going up. Um, but also part of resilience is ensuring that industries continue to grow and thrive and you know our industries as many industries are facing their own unique challenges and ours is certainly an, an immediate threat from the Australian uh, tax incentives for the games industry and we, we personally have lost many staff to that uh, but it's just an example of many other industries that will be facing their own unique challenges. What, what is the government focusing on in the budget in terms of providing resilience for and also growth uh, opportunities for the many sectors around the country. Yeah, thank, thanks very much for the question and acknowledging uh, Pickpock is a great Wellington business, um, starting in the hut and finding its way to Willis Street. That's as far as you need to go. You don't need to go any further. Um, but, but growing extraordinarily along the way. And the game development sector is a good example of a, a sector, particularly in this city, in this region, um, that's contributing enormously. I think you're up to about $400 million in, in the last um, financial year. So it's a sector that, that's doing well and, and we understand uh, both the potential for growth and the challenges that sit in front of you. Um, I'm not going to go into, into specific industries today or what the budget may or may, may not do for them, but certainly recognise the point you're making. I think our role there is twofold. The first is, sorry to harp on a theme, but to get the basic underpinnings of things right. I mean, you want to know that you can get to work, uh, that your, the lights will come on when you do get to work, um, that the facilities around you will be you know, will be the quality ones you've got. Those core responsibilities of government around infrastructure and so on underpin businesses' ability to do your job well. And they're our job. And as I say, I don't think necessarily successive governments have done that as well as we want, and we will continue to do the big investments to make infrastructure work. But then there's the second part of it, which is how do we support industries that are going to grow the high-wage, low-emissions jobs that I talked about in my speech? And that's our goal. So three parts to our economic plan. High wage, which is code for productivity. That's what we mean, a more productive economy. It's just productivity is one of the most boring words in the English language. So we found a reframing of it. Uh, low emissions, because as Iona pointed out in her question, that's what we have to do, but there's also opportunity within it. And then all of that providing economic uh, security. So that means partnerships with the business sector. And we've got to make sure it's a, it's a genuine partnership. The government can't support every industry or every business, and actually people in this room don't want us to do that. But we do recognise we've got a role if we want the economy to transform that way, to be there alongside sectors and businesses. 
And so um, we've continued to do that. We have a set of industry transformation plans. One of them is in the digital skills sector. Um, we've also got them in areas like horticulture, which has been affected. So you can expect to see us continue to support along that while balancing that with all the other needs that we've got. But um, yeah, I want to recognise the growth and the innovation that I see in the gaming development sector and, and, and thank and congratulate you for your hard work. Right down there. I'm glad someone from that side of the room said something. I apologise for the nature of this function room. You feel like one of those sideshow dummies. It's OK, thank you. Uh, you mentioned about immigration and pleasing number that we're up to 52,000. For the budget, what immigration levels, net immigration levels, are you forecasting over the next three years and, and what might the government, and, and I suppose this is not directly a budget question, although yeah. it underpins the budget, what are you looking at for net immigration numbers over the next three years? Yeah, so you won't be surprised that I'm not going to give out, out, out those budget forecasts today. The Treasurer would be very upset with me if I did that. Uh, but clearly we are seeing a return to higher levels. You know, we, went, we, we were down at basically zero, um, and now we're seeing those levels pick up significantly. We've never targeted a specific number, and I don't think that's the way to do it. It's about making sure that we're meeting the needs of business rather than targeting a specific number. So the changes that we made to immigration settings have been very much aimed at that, at making sure we've got the right person for the right job at the right time. And obviously we've done the reset around things like the accredited employer scheme. Um, that is starting to work. Now I, I get the stats on the numbers and how quickly they're being processed and we're, 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 we're really getting there. The gap at the moment is that once the job check's done, the ability to find someone to fulfil the visa. That's, that's the current issue that we've all got. So we're going to continue to support Immigration New Zealand to actually implement the scheme and to make the process changes that they need to make uh, to be able to, to process as quickly as they possibly can. Uh, but we won't target a specific number because ultimately it's about delivering for you. I do just want to make the point too that for me this is always, um, there are two tracks here. As a small open economy with only about five million people, we need immigration to be able to deliver the living standards to New Zealanders that we all want. Uh, but we can't neglect training people who are here as well. And it is incredibly important that that partnership with business continue. You know, even when you have unemployment at a very low level, like in 3.4%, there are still more opportunities to support people, to train and to retrain. And I just urge all of us to work together uh, to do that because it doesn't work unless both tracks are going together. So in terms of the forecast, you'll see them next week, but clearly the numbers are picking up. Thank you. Thanks, Grant. Um, I think we've just got time for two more. Is that right? Sure. Yeah, Mike here and then there's one there, I think. I feel a bit like I'm serenading you here, Minister. Uh, <laughs> Down on so, your knee, Mike. <laughs> uh, so, so my question really followed on from one a couple back, that we know, well, as you say, productivity is not a particularly sexy word. It is a, a key tool in combating inflation. So are you looking at any particular levers to encourage you know, business with the transformation and investment that they can you know, use to enhance productivity? Yeah, uh, and similar to the to the question before about inflation, you know, the product New Zealand's productivity challenge is decades long, and if it were easy to solve, it would have been solved. So it's multifaceted. I'll just skate across the sort of four things that I think are important, and some of these are obviously featuring in the budget. One of them is actually our ability is, I think one of the reasons New Zealand productivity levels have been a bit lower than other countries is our distance. Um, that distance is being eliminated by technology, but also by the trade agreements that we do. And being able to have, see the UK free trade agreement come into force earlier than expected is great. Similarly with the EU one, we've got to keep pressing out on that, expanding the number of countries in CPTPP, um, celebrating our 40th anniversary of CER with Australia and looking at how we can enhance the world's best free trade agreement um, there. So, you know, that doesn't sound like something that's direct, but it's really important for being able to get over some of the tyranny of distance that, that New Zealand experiences. Um, infrastructure, skills, research and innovation. There are three key areas where I know business wants more and greater access to the skilled labour force and to the new ideas and the innovation. 
and the Prime Minister signalled in his pre-budget speech at the end of April that those three areas would be ones that we will be um, highlighting in this budget, uh, and because they are drivers of productivity. And so if you put those things together, all of those four or five things together, to me they're the core elements that we need to work on. Uh, you know, there's basic productivity enhancing initiatives that businesses do themselves and will always do. We provided a bit of boost around things like Digital Boost and the, and the, the programs to help people there. I think businesses are normalising that and now we want to focus on these big uh, picture areas which I think can help a lot. Thanks, Minister. Um, I'm Letitia Harding, the Chief Executive for Taha Ora Asthma and Respiratory Foundation New Zealand, and um, I guess I'm coming from it from a different perspective from the not-for-profit sector, but we are reliant on business doing well and obviously the impact of cost of living because we rely on donations and grants. Um, and my question is, you know, with over 27,000 charities in New Zealand, is that on the radar? <laughs> you know, it can be incredibly frustrating whether it's true or not hearing about the money spent on consultants, et cetera. <laughs> and whether that's true or not, I don't know. But are not-for-profits you know, on the radar in this next budget? Thank you. Thanks for your question, Letitia. And I mean, I obviously people will be aware that I chose one aspect to speak on today just because of, of the nature of what we do. But as I said, our wellbeing budgets have very much been about not just looking at what we do in terms of finances as an, as an end, but rather a means to the end of the society we want. And part of the strength of our communities, which is one of our, one of our pillars of the wellbeing approach, is the non-profit sector. So we absolutely understand and, and accept that uh, and have continued over the last few budgets to be able to support how we can. It'll never be enough. <laughs> um, and so we recognise that, that long-term role in which the government with New Zealanders works to support organisations like you. One of the things we can do is get the health system right so that it supports the ultimate co-papa co that you've got. And so obviously the health reforms have been a significant part of trying to reorientate the system to be able to do that. That's a work in progress, as you well know. Uh, and this year represents the second year of our multi-year funding approach, which has been designed to allow the health system to be more effective in the way it works with the likes of your, your foundation. So you can expect to see that work um, continue and to do what we can uh, to support non the non-profit sector. But yeah, as I say, the wellbeing approach has communities as one of its core pillars and the way we all work together to support your, your kinds of organisations matters a lot. Thank you very much, Minister. Um, and before you go, uh, <clears throat> we have a gift uh, in, in uh, appreciation of your address. It's from one of our chamber members, Atarangi. Um, so um, thank you very much, uh, and I'm sure everyone has taken a lot from this, and you can go and explain to the media the $4 billion worth of savings that you're going to get. <clears throat> thank you very much.